The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Hey, Carrot Oosterhouse here with realagriculture.com. I am back here today with a Wheat School episode, and I have here with me John Gavlowski, who is the Provincial Entomologist with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. How is it going today? It is going good. Great. So we are here today to talk about grasshoppers, specifically in your cereals. So there's specific grasshoppers that do really like those cereals. Can you talk a bit about them? Yeah. So um, now, first of all, there's a lot of different types of grasshoppers. Um, There's well over 100 species across Canada. We've got really four species we consider to be pest species of grasshoppers. And of those four... One of them, the clear wing grasshopper, is a grass specialist. So it'll feed on cereals, forage grasses, wild grasses, doesn't really care much for broadleaf plants. So it's, it's sometimes a good idea to get to know the dominant species when grasshoppers become numerous uh, because it gives you a clue what they're likely to be feeding on. If by chance clear wing grasshopper is the dominant species, you really got to watch your cereals. This year, two-striped grasshopper seems to be our dominant species in Manitoba, and I think some other areas of the prairies as well. Uh, two-striped grasshopper is a generalist. They they do like a lot of the broadleaf plants, but they will feed on the cereals. So when they're abundant, you really do have to watch pretty much all your crops. They do have their, their favorites, um, but yeah, you really do have to watch pretty much all your crops. And between those four dominant species, is there specific thresholds for each of them, or is it uh, kind of the same throughout each species? What's tricky with grasshoppers is we really don't have good quantitative species-specific thresholds. They essentially are nominal thresholds. They're our best guess given the information that's available, uh, but they are general across species. So Um, In cereal crops, we often recommend uh, if you've got it more than about 8 to 12 per meter square on average, that's probably a population that will cause economic damage. But again, whether it's two-striped migratory or clear-wing grasshopper, you'd be using the same threshold. And are grasshoppers beneficial insects to any other species out there? Like, is it important that we're really following those thresholds? Uh, Well, uh, there again there's a lot of different types of grasshoppers there are a lot of uh, grassland birds and things that do like eating grasshoppers some mammals as well um, even some reptiles that eat grasshoppers so they, they are part of the food chain uh, from that perspective there's also beneficial insects that keep their populations going with grasshoppers as their main food source and i'll give you a couple examples here um, there's something called uh, the black blister beetle and another one called the ash gray blister beetle. Uh, these species of blister beetles, the larvae feed almost solely on grasshopper eggs. This year, we're seeing a lot of black blister beetles around. And that's in response to the grasshoppers being numerous. So I guess if there's some sort of silver lining to there being a lot of grasshoppers, it does help build up the, the populations of some of these beneficials. Another one is bee flies. Um, which might look like a bumblebee when they come to a flower. They're kind of a larger fly. Uh, That's why they call them bee flies. They almost mimic bees. They will selectively follow grasshoppers, figure out where they're laying their eggs, and lay their eggs right next to the grasshopper eggs. And it's, again, um, almost specifically grasshopper eggs that the bee fly larvae feed on. So those populations tend to build up when there's a lot of grasshoppers as well. And what sort of conditions do you grasshoppers like? Like if we're seeing a lot of uh, drought in certain areas, are we going to most likely see more grasshoppers? Grasshoppers thrive in, here in North America. They thrive under hot, dry conditions. Uh, that's normally when we see most of them. There's a fungal pathogen that seems to take quite a few of them out if we get a lot of damp, humid weather. And... If you get several hot, dry years in a row, that's often what will build the grasshopper population up. And that's exactly what's been happening here on the prairies. Uh, We we did have uh, a very wet September and early October last year. However, egg laying time 
back in August was quite dry, and most of the summer was actually quite dry. The eggs can survive excess humidity very well. Uh, a colleague of mine took some grasshopper eggs and put them in a glass of water for a week, dumped out the water, and the eggs hatched. So once they're in the egg stage, they're quite resilient. The excess moisture really won't do much to them um, in October or even in April and May. It's heavy rains in June, July, and August that can really knock their population back. So yeah, we've had some dry years, and it's helped build the population up. And what's your best recommendations for scouting practices? So number one is start scouting early. Start scouting in June. Early June is a good time. Now, early June, they're, they're probably just starting to hatch, so you'll start to pick up on that. Mid to late June, if they're going to be abundant, you will probably start to see a lot of the small little nymphs hopping around. When they first hatch out, they're about the size of a wheat kernel. Then they progressively start getting bigger. And once we get into late June, early July, there's going to be a lot that are essentially half-grown grasshoppers, so roughly half the size of your adult. So they're becoming a bit more visible. They'll have little wing buds, but not really fully developed wings, so they can't fly yet. So they're still going to be concentrated around where the eggs were laid. At that point, they're much easier to control than when they're adults. So we encourage people, start your scouting in June, and especially right now, uh, when we get into July, late June, early July, that's a really good time to be out there doing grasshopper scouting. Um, the way it's done is you're, you're trying to guesstimate approximate levels of the grasshoppers in the, the ditch or the crop that you're, you're scouting. So walk the area, and as, as you're walking, try to visualize about a meter square area in front of you. As you get to that area, stir up the vegetation a bit and try to estimate numbers that are jumping around or remaining in that vegetation. It's not a precise count. There's, there's no way you can do an accurate count when you walk into an area and there's a lot of jumping going around. But you'll get a good idea. Was that just three or four that jumped? Or was that 10, 10 or 12? Was it 20, 25? You'll have some rough ideas. That's what you're trying to figure out. Now, if you walked in and it was a cloud of grasshoppers jumping around, uh, that gives you some good information right there. Now, if you're not controlling these grasshoppers and you're not doing the proper scouting methods, um, what sort of yield impacts can it can they actually have? Well, worst case scenario, we have seen situations where um, fields had well over half the yield taken away by grasshoppers. That can happen. Now, that's the extreme situations. Uh, often it is more that 10 to 20 percent yield loss. But uh, where we see the higher yield loss is uh, when they're doing their feeding later in the crop staging and they're actually feeding on the heads, clipping heads. Uh, in some crops, they'll feed on the stem uh, and actually be clipping heads off of the crop. That can, of course, cause quite severe yield loss. So a lot of times it will be in that 10 to 20 percent range when we have these economic populations, which is still quite significant, but it can get even worse if it's a very heavy population and they're damaging heads. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, now that we're into July, do your scouting. If you find some very heavy populations, now is a good time to control them before they're adults. Adult control gets much more difficult. You've got a couple different options for control. Um, there's brand there's a brand bait on the market that can be used. There's also several foliar insecticides. Uh, the price range between them is um, quite variable. Uh, one technique that people have been using, especially on the pasture lands, is spraying in strips. Some of the products have very good residual, and grasshoppers tend to move around a lot. And there was research done on rangeland in Wyoming that showed that if you spray just in strips, so you're, you're treating a strip and then leaving a strip and treating the next one and essentially doing half of your, your rangeland or pasture, you can still get 80% plus control, which um, is, it might not be quite as good as what you would get doing the whole pasture, but, but that might be sufficient and you can do it at half the cost. So that's a technique. I know people have been trying that in their cereal crops as well over the last year or so and anecdotally saying they thought they got good results it's just a technique people have been using if they have a favorite 
say, high residual product, but they want to get that cost down a bit, uh, spraying this strip might be an option.